Hi everybody, it's Wynn. Hey guys, it's Daniel. Hi, it's Kim Kim. My name's Little Bronwyn. Hello everyone, it's Ed. Hi everybody, it's Kit. And welcome to another video by The Entropy System. Hi everybody, it's Wynn. Oh boy, so today we're gonna talk about some things. Recently, a popular YouTube creator uploaded a video um, saying that she has dissociative identity disorder, um, which on its own is neither here nor there, but there was a lot of damaging misinformation that was shared in that video, as well as hate thrown towards um, dissociated specifically. I don't recommend going to the video that I'm mentioning because you're just giving somebody views when, you know, and encouraging bad behavior if that happens. But you can check out Dissociated's video or Fragmented Psyche's video. They had some pretty good reaction videos um, and you can kind of hear what this YouTuber is saying. This video is not to correct the misinformation that she put out. In fact, we have a ton of videos designed to correct misinformation. We have them in our playlist, A Beginner's Guide to DID. We explain things like structural dissociation and tackle specific common myths about DID. Um, so if you're wanting good, solid educational material with cited sources, please do check that out. We worked really hard on those videos. This also is not a reaction video to that big video. Um, this is more of a reaction to the reaction to that video. Let me explain. Everybody knows that the hill that I have chosen to stand and die on is that we should never call somebody fake if they claim to have DID or OSDD. That does not excuse this YouTuber's behavior. Having a diagnosis or not having a diagnosis doesn't matter if you're toxic. If you have toxic behavior and you're spreading hate, I don't care if you have the disorder you say you have it or you're not, you're still being bad and I'm not gonna tolerate that. However, when a video like this blows up, there's always a fallout of, this is why she's faking, this is, a good point of why this couldn't possibly be DID, etc, etc. There were things that she said that I related to in my own personal journey. So the people who I am talking to in this video are the people who have been watching the fallout, watched the video, read the comments, have been reading conversations about it on Twitter, and thought, oh my god, am I faking? Am I bad? Am I invalid because something that she said resonated with me? Because I can relate to this person? Does that reflect badly on me? My answer is no, it doesn't. And I have a list of 10 things that were discussed in this video that absolutely do not invalidate you as a system if you experience this. Numbered lists are an easy way to put things. So here we go, numbered list. Point number one, feeling that you don't have your own identity. As a host, this is something that I have struggled with both before and after realizing I was part of a system. While in therapy, I spent a lot of time addressing the fact that I didn't really know who I was outside of what I felt I was expected to be and what I was told to be by the people in my surroundings. I felt completely molded by them and I didn't know where external expectation ended and my own personality began. And as I started to get to know my alters, this also became really, it, it just, it, it continued to be a struggle because they seemed so individual and well-defined. And I was just like, you know, all these traits that I kind of saw in myself, is that actually you? You know, did this emotion come from you? Did this action come from you? How, what, how much of that is actually me? Struggling in, in who is when, as an individual, as an alter, as a person who exists, you know, that was something that I really struggled with. So being a host, or even not being a host, just being an alter in a system, and not being sure of your own identity, and who you are, and what defines you as you, that's valid. That's that's totally valid. I, I feel like people go through that even if they're not a part of a system. So if that's something that you are struggling with, that doesn't, 
at all reflect on your v validity as a survivor or a system or a human being with feelings and thoughts and, and all that jazz. Number two, struggling with gender identity. Gender identity is complex. It's, it's complex if you are just one person in one body. It is extremely common and in fact healthy for people who are struggling with their gender identity to try on different hats until they figure out what they feel comfortable with. M you know, maybe they'll switch their identities. Maybe they'll say, well, I think I'm non-binary. Oh, no, 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 I think I'm gender fluid. I think I'm a trans man. I think, you know, until they really find the place that clicks for them, they'll experiment with who they are. That's beautiful, that's wonderful, that's healthy. If you're a part of a system, it complicates things times a billion because in addition to trying to figure out your own sexuality and your own gender identity, you also have a bunch of other people sharing your body who have their own gender identity and sexuality to find. And it can be difficult to say, you know, hey, am I gender fluid? Or is my male alter just really close and influencing me right now? I thought I was gender fluid for a bit until I figured out, you know, that Daniel was an alter and not just a different state of mind for me. If you find yourself identifying as different genders or in different ways over time as you're trying to figure out who you are, that is completely legit. Again, not just for systems, but for literally anybody. Number three, mimicking those who are around you. We, as human beings, are pack animals. We thrive on community. And being a part of community often means that we grow shared behaviors. It helps the sense of unity. If you see a group of tight-knit friends, you might notice that they all have very similar speech patterns or share a very specific slang that only they use. And that's because just by the nature of who we are as people, we adopt traits of those who are close to us. That's, that's a normal thing. In my experience, trauma survivors tend to do this a lot more than, you know, your average Joe, because trauma survivors are often trained to keep a low profile and blend in, don't draw attention to oneself. So parroting the, the words and behaviors of people close by are easy ways to do that. When I was in high school, I would listen to people talk about their opinions on things like uh, you know, movies or music or politics or whatever. And then in a later conversation, I would say word for word what that other person had said. It helped me feel better because I had such a terrible memory because I was losing time and things didn't make sense. So if I could at least sound like I understood things and wasn't constantly forgetting things, it made me feel more secure. As a part of a system, learning to parrot people was a defense mechanism for me. It also, going back to that first point, really messed with my sense of identity and made it hard for me to figure out who I am. <laughs> but that's all part of being a survivor, or at least it is for me. Thing that doesn't make you invalid, number four, feeling confused when another alter fronts or is co-conscious and not knowing where you end and they begin. I've heard a lot of people who are in the beginning of their diagnostic process or in the beginning of like really understanding their DID or OSDD talk about how when another alter fronts, it's even though they don't have full control over their behavior, it still feels like it's them. Now there is such a thing as passive influence where an alter who is close to the front can influence the behavior of the alter who is actually up front. But because DID is meant to be covert, especially to the host, DID is meant to be hidden even from the host, the, the alter who is in charge of daily living, basically. The brain makes up excuses to why things happen. Whenever Kit would front, before I knew who Kit was or that I was part of the system, I thought that that was still me because I was co-conscious. I started behaving in ways that I couldn't explain, but uh, the way I saw it, it was just instinct taking over and instinct told me to be extra social. Does that actually make sense as an explanation? No, but 
when you live your life needing to explain gaps in memory and strange behaviors of yourself, you find ways to logic it away, even if the logic is unsound. So if you find switching and co-consciousness confusing or hard to describe, especially if you're early on in your journey of discovery, as far as I'm concerned, that's super duper normal. Thing that doesn't invalidate you, number five, having alters with no amnesia between them. That is what it is to have OSDD1B. It is basically the same as DID in every way, except that the alters have no dissociative amnesia between them. They're still distinct parts and individual people, and they can still experience dissociative amnesia as a group, but that amnesia has nothing to do with who is up front at a specific time. If you feel like you have DID, but you're worried because you have no amnesia between your parts, you might have OSDD1B. Item number six, having parts that seem more like extreme parts of you rather than being like very distinctly different people. That is one of the criteria for OSDD1A, which is very, very much like dissociative identity disorder, except there are not distinct separate identities. There's still dissociative amnesia between these parts, but the parts are not distinct different people. They're more like extreme versions of the one person. The important thing to remember though is for OSDD1A, there must be amnesia between the parts. Regular switching of moods and values and behaviors can also be indicative of borderline personality disorder. And if you are wondering which one you might have, a trained therapist would be able to distinguish that and help you uh, in your path to healing. Item number seven, not being able to remember early life trauma. DID gets created because it the brain needs to hide trauma from other parts of the brain. That is why DID is created. So if you don't remember early, early life trauma, that doesn't make you invalid. And that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you as a system. That just means that your brain decided you shouldn't remember things. So if you remember having alters before you remember trauma, that just means that those memories are repressed. That doesn't mean that you're invalid or that there's anything wrong with you. Even after I was diagnosed with DID, I spent a lot of time saying, well, no, I only had teenage and adult trauma, childhood trauma. Pfft. Obviously that was wrong and through therapy, I've gotten a lot of those memories back, but I was the host. I was the one in charge of not knowing. So it took a while for me to accept that this was a thing that happened and to be allowed to remember those things, the memories that my alters held. Item number eight that doesn't invalidate you. Having alters that seem to only have one emotion or function. These are often referred to as fragments. If there is an alter that only exists to do the dishes or only exists to eat or use something like that, that is completely valid. Not all alters are going to be fully fleshed out identities. For the sake of surviving trauma, sometimes an alter just needs to be a one trick pony to get in, do a job and go out. Not every alter in your system has to be as well defined as myself or as Kit or as Kim Kim. It's all gonna be unique to what you needed as a system to get through what you were going through. Item number nine that doesn't invalidate you, not being aware of time loss or amnesia. Like I was saying earlier, the brain finds ways to logic away things that happen to make sure that the host continues to not know about their system. This can involve being so dissociated that you dissociate from your dissociation, which sounds really complicated, but I was fully not aware that I was losing time for just about all of my life. It wasn't until I really started paying attention and finding things weird like socks in the sink and all of my forks missing one day, that I started to realize that I was losing time without knowing it. If you are early on in your healing journey or your journey to discovering your system and you think things are weird because, well, I don't lose time, isn't that wrong? You may just be unaware of it as a defense mechanism. That doesn't mean that you're faking or that you're lying to yourself. It just means that that's what your brain has needed to do up until now. Also, as I said earlier, it could be indicative of OSDD1B, where you have alters, but you don't have dissociative amnesia between those alters. And again, 
just as valid as having DID. Finally, number 10 of the things that don't invalidate you as a system is not having words to describe what you're going through. When you're experiencing something that most people don't experience, it can be hard to find the words to describe that. Even we have trouble describing certain things until we talk about it in our videos or with other people who have DID. They are able to share their experiences and together we find ways to really pinpoint, oh yeah, that's how I could say what I'm ex experiencing. Just because it happens to you doesn't mean you fully understand it. And if you find yourself floundering or explaining things in ways that may not make sense to you or to other people, that's totally fine. You're not expected to be an expert just because you have a disorder. Is it a good idea to study what you have and work with a therapist or a professional? Absolutely. The more you can understand about yourself in any situation, the better. But if you are at a point where you don't really understand and you can't really describe it, that's fine. That's, that's normal, that's human. Again, the one thing I want everybody to take out of this situation, even though, you know, there's wild drama happening, is that the drama that happens and the things that people on the internet say do not reflect on your validity and your story. Only you know your truth and it is important that you stay honest with yourself and who you are. If you find people struggling with this, please use this video as a reference to reassure them and let them know that there's nothing wrong with them. They're just in their own place, in their own journey. And everyone, please remember that you are loved, you are valuable, and you are valid. Take care, guys. Bye. Before I sign off, I'd like to thank Elizabeth and all of our patrons for supporting our channel and helping us do what we do on a weekly basis. You guys are awesome. You make these videos possible. You help us create better content every day. Also, I want to remind you guys about the Entitled to Life conference in November in San Francisco, hosted by Twa Magazine. And if you can't attend in person, that's totally okay. You can get an e-ticket and watch the exclusive stream on Zoom. We're super excited to be there and we can't wait to meet you. 